All right. Uh, if you have your Bibles, would you join me in Joshua chapter 24? We're going to read one verse out of there, verse 15. And I want you to think of, of course, the emphasis of that verse, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And whenever I say that statement and you think of your house as it exists right now, what does that bring to mind? See, the most important thing of a house is not the selling price. We sold our house this past week, hopefully, if everything flows as it should. We should close on our house back in Belton uh, at the end of this month. But the most important thing about any house is not the selling price. A real estate will tell you it's location, 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 the three most important things about a house. Well, it's not how many bedrooms. It's not the neighborhood. It's not the interest rate. The most important thing about a house is something that I noticed when I went to about 3,000 of them in Belton handing out uh, information about the church there. Every 500th house or so, there would be this plaque, which we have at our house as well. And this plaque is out of Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And when you think of your house, the most important thing is not how fancy it is on the inside or the outside, how good the grass looks. The most important thing about your house is, is God welcome there? Is it a house where you are serving Christ? Where the atmosphere is conducive to welcoming Christ and the emphasis of the house from the top to the bottom is that we are a people who belong to Jesus Christ and we are about serving Him. The more homes you have like that in a neighborhood and a community, the more of an impact it's going to have for Christ. And the more of an impact it has for Christ, the more of a moral avalanche in a positive sense will happen for a community. We're seeing the negative of that. But the, pos the positive is possible. When Billy Graham came to Shreveport, after he left, liquor sales dropped 40%. The sale of Bibles increased 300%. When he went to Seattle, the result was that in pending divorce cases, many of them were dropped. When he went to Greensboro, North Carolina, the report came out after that that the entire social structure of the city was affected. Now, Billy Sunday, he was followed by Bruce Barton. Bruce Barton was a young reporter who was given the assignment of exposing Billy Sunday. And he went to three communities. And after he went to these three communities, this is what he said. He said, I talked to the merchants, and they told me that during the meetings and afterwards, that people walked up to the, to the counters and they paid bills which were so old that they had since, long since been written off the books. The president of one of the city's chamber of commerce said, I'm not a member of any church, but if it was proposed now to bring Billy Sunday to this town and the churches couldn't raise the funds to bring him I could raise the money in half a day from men who never go to church. He left a different moral atmosphere. That moral atmosphere, believe it or not, for some of the young people in America, they have never seen it. They have grown up with what many of us who are a little bit older mourn about because we've seen something different. And I know people who are older than me have seen something much different. I grew up with Gilligan's Island and uh, all these shows that were totally non-offensive morally. They didn't always try to have bring an agenda. They didn't always try to change your mind, influence you on these. They just tried to entertain you and to try to have positiveness about them. Things have changed so drastically today. For those who have never known the difference, that difference can return. When people... God's people make choices to put God back first in their life. The Bible says in the Old Testament, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will heal, heal their land. You don't see in that verse when the liquor stores close down, when the bars are shut down, when the pornography is gotten rid of. It says when my people who are called by my name humble themselves, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal their land. You want revival in this land, that's the first step. It starts in the house of God. 
when we determine that we are going to be different from the world, we give God a tool to use in this world to begin to change it. As long as we're just like the world, we'll never have an influence on the world. If I'm drowning, don't send me another drowner. Send me somebody who can swim. And people in this world need to see somebody who is swimming. They don't need somebody to come and identify with them and they're drowning. They need somebody who can swim. And the only reason that we can swim in this world is because of the grace of God. And they need to recognize that is why, so that they also can grasp hold of that. In verse 15 it says this, If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Whether gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Here is Joshua at the end of his, his life. They have gone into the land. They've conquered much of the land. They've even gone through the process of dividing the land, even though much of it is still possessed by different Canaanite tribes. And Joshua is at the end of his life and leadership, and he is challenging them. Now that he's turning over the responsibility of, of leadership to others, he's challenging them to make the decision, the hard decision, that they are not going to fall under the influence of the land around them that is godless but that they are going to stick to their spiritual guns and that they are going to put Christ first. They are going to serve God and to watch what God will do through their lives. I want to share quickly three statements that we find here in this verse. Number one, if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord. Here Joshua is encouraging people to declare themselves. We live in a time in history where every sinful behavior there is has come out of the closet. Many of them have gone into the cabinet in, in Washington. Too many Christians have taken their place in the closet. Too many Christians are beginning to hide from their faith. Too many Christians are backing away from having their feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, not being prepared to make a defense of the hope which lies within us. I visited a couple of preschools this, this past week. And these preschools are state licensed. And because of that state licensing, Title 10, I believe, is what, or Title 1 or Title 10 comes into play. And what it demands of them is that anything of re religious nature has to be covered up when the kids come in for that week of preschool. Whether it's a church or a, a, a part of a church is a worship area or any other part of the church, if those kids come to that area, they've got to cover it up and they cannot be exposed to the things of that religious nature. That is the movement that our nation has taken since the early 60s. And really the influence was there earlier, but they began to act on it at that point. And we have to ask ourselves, are we going to follow along in the flow of that, or are we going to be different? Joshua challenged them, if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, let it be known. But if it isn't, make the hard choice. There is no fence, there is no middle ground. You've got to make a choice one way or the other. You've got to learn to live for Christ and what that means and what that demands for you and for your family and then make the hard choices day after day. My brother, my oldest brother, I'm the youngest of three brothers and we've got an older sister. My brother to me epitomized what I thought it meant to be a, a, a Christian. Somebody that I, I thought could, could answer all the questions He's about five, six years older than me, just running ahead of me. And it seemed like uh, he was a perfect youth in the church. Whenever they had youth Sunday where the youth would fill in different positions of leadership, uh, he would do uh, the church announcements, welcoming visitors. Others would lead in, in music. It seemed like he was, was always putting on the, the perfect facade during those times. I thought he was a perfect Christian. But after he got older... Somehow his heart just turned completely away from God. He began to ridicule those things. Never even came into a church anymore. Began, he had one daughter. Began to raise her up a certain way. Came in one day and found my mom, who was very religious, praying with her over her lunch. And his statement at that time was, I knew you would learn bad habits around here. That girl grew up to be a teenager. Often she would come at her grandmother's uh, uh, beckoning to church. She'd sit on the back row and do her homework. 
and she was making grandma happy by being in church. The house she grew up in went through divorce. The house she grew up in went through turmoil, went through all the, the problems, through, through drug problems, runaway problems. And now she's a young woman getting up at 18, 19 years of age, and finally this year for the first time she is recognizing a difference between, between grandma, grandma's stability, grandma's unchanging commitment, that grandma is the same as she was 20 years ago. And for the first time, she has finally said to grandma, Grandma, whatever it takes to go where you go in eternity, I want to do that. She's seen both sides of that. And she's recognizing there is a difference. You may be looking at your house and wondering, is there any power to change this? Is there any power for things to be different? You may look at our country. Is there any hope for our country? It seems to be just going further and further into the tank. It begins when Christians make the hard choices that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But first we have to recognize, is it distasteful, distasteful to us? Is it disagreeable with us to serve God? When the issue comes up at the workroom, when it comes up in the schoolroom, is my first response to react negatively to it? When I see somebody who's excited about their faith, do I think, well, that's just a fanatic. That's a Bible thumper. That's somebody who, who's just overly zealous. Am I willing to look at my own life and ask, is there any passion in me at all for the faith that I claim to stand for, for the Christ that I claim to represent? Or am I, if I'm honest, and look in the mirror and see exactly all that is there, warts and all, am I a person who is really ashamed of the gospel? Because the society around me is putting so much pressure against the person of Christ that my reaction is, I don't want to be a negative person. I don't want to be a person out there who's rejected. And so, not recognizing it, I am a person who has, who has found the gospel, who has found the person of Christ disagreeable in my sight. You'll never change until you're willing to answer that question. I want to share with you something that's scary. As you look at our country, and if we don't do anything different, this is a cycle that happens. I found a thing that was written before our country became a country. In fact, it was written uh, while we were still colonies of, of the British. It was written by a man who looked back 2,000 years earlier at the Athenian democracy. And he was studying democracy. And as he looked at them, he, he made one statement which said that the average length of, of a democracy of a, of a nation is about 200 years. So we're living on borrowed time. We're in overtime here as far as the average is. But then as he was looking at democracies, and not ours because ours hadn't even begun at that time, but as he looked at what happened in democracies of the past, he developed what he called the cycle of democracy. And this is how he said it went. He says it begins with bondage. People come out of bondage and they go into spiritual faith. They move from spiritual faith to great courage. They go from great courage to liberty. Sounds like our history books, the ones I grew up with. They go from liberty to abundance. They go from abundance to selfishness. They go from selfishness to complacency. They go from complacency to apathy. They go from apathy to dependency. They go from dependency back to bondage. Can you see America making some steps along there as you look at our history? And you wonder, where are we today? It seems like more and more people want the government to call all the shots. And in order for the government to call all the shots, you have to give up your own personal liberties. Are we moving from apathy into dependency? That I don't really care anymore. As long as they keep the water coming and the electricity on, as long as the economy's good, I don't care. And we're offending God with the stench of our nation and not caring because we think things are just in order enough for my life to keep floating. We don't recognize how disagreeable that is in the face of a holy God. The second statement that Joshua brings out here is, Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. You have to make a choice whom you will serve. 
Joshua declared again, there's no middle ground. You have to make a decision who you will choose. Number one, you all must choose. Every one of us must make a choice. If you do not make a choice for God, you are making a choice against God, whether you recognize that or not. Elijah came near to those who were gathered on Mount Carmel and he said this, How long will you halt or hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. If Baal, follow Him. That word hesitate, again, it literally means halt. How long will you be crippled between two opinions? When you don't make a decision either for God or against God, you are like a crippled person who is going nowhere. And Elijah said, when you are hesitating, whether you're going to follow God or follow, follow uh, Baal, you may think you're open-minded, you're tolerant, but you're crippled. You're going nowhere. You must make a decision. Jesus said it this way in Revelation. I would that you were hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. I will vomit you. A person who is cold against God is at least making a decision. A person who is hot for God is making a decision. But a person who is apathetic and said, I don't care, just kind of going through the motions, that sickens God. That you don't care enough about the issue of God to make a stand one way or another. Every one of us must choose. And we've got to choose for ourselves. Joshua said, you've got a choice. You can choose the gods of the Egyptians, the gods of your fathers. You can choose the gods of the people in the land. Or you can choose the one true God. And you'll meet people. And you'll ask them, what are you? And they'll say, well, I'm a Baptist. I'm a Presbyterian. I'm a Methodist. I'm a Catholic. And you'll ask them about that. And they'll say, uh, well, my mom was, or my dad was, or my grandma was. It's just we've always been that way. And Joshua says, don't serve the gods of your fathers in Egypt. And he says, don't serve the gods of the Amorites who are in the land. Some people, they're just, whatever is politically correct right now, whatever the prevailing wind is, that's what they do. That's the opinion they pick up. Whatever the poll says is the highest, then that's the one I'm going to go with. I'm going to jump on the bandwagon. Joshua says, don't do that. Don't serve the gods of the people all around you in the land. Make the hard choice, discover who God is, and serve God. Are you willing to make that choice? Every one of us has to choose. Every one of us has to choose for themselves. If I could, I would walk this aisle six times. Six times this morning during the invitation, if I could walk this aisle and get every one of my kids saved. But I can't do that. My mom would have done that. She would have walked the aisle for all of us kids. But she'd have had to beat be my grandma. My grandma would have done it long before my mom could. But we have to choose for ourselves. You may be sitting by the most spiritual person in this church. That person may be a wonderful friend of yours. That person may be your wife or husband. But they're not going to be there when you stand before Jesus Christ. When you stand in judgment, you will stand alone. You will stand on the choices that you are making. Not your parents, not your church. You'll stand alone. You won't stand as a Baptist. You will stand as yourself. Every one of us must choose. And we all must choose today. Not a one of us is promised tomorrow. Not a one of us is promised this afternoon. By God's grace, we have this day. By God's grace, we have this opportunity to make a decision, to make a difference now, and to not pay all the penalty of what's been passed in our life. Joshua said, choose for yourselves today. When Stanley found Livingston in Africa, he'd been there 30 years, but they had not heard from him for two years. And Stanley tried to get Livingston to come back. And Livingston refused to come back. Two days after he made that refusal, he wrote this down in his diary. He said, today, March 19th, my birthday, I again dedicate my whole self to Jesus, King of my life, my all. Accept me and grant, O gracious Father, that before this year is gone, I may finish the work that you've given me. A year after he wrote that in his diary, his servants came in and found him on his knees, dead. He died in the act of prayer. But he made a declaration, 
again and again that he was going to serve God no matter what that asked of his life, no matter how much he was being tugged to go a different direction, he was going to serve God at all costs and to the end. Let me quickly give you a third statement that Joshua gives. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua was the, the example. You make your decision, but as for me and my house, we are going to make a decision to serve God, and we will serve Him. And God will use a person like that. You may think that whether I serve God or not is no big deal because I'm not worth much anyway. You'd be amazed what God can do with any person who gives himself 100% to Him. You would be amazed what God would do. Look in the Bible. God used a donkey. God used a whale. God used a, a harlot in, in Jericho. God used fishermen. Jesus was a carpenter's son. God used shepherds. God used fig pickers. God used ex-cons like Joseph and, and Paul. God, Jesus said that he'd raise up stones if he needed to to praise if the others weren't praising and, and honoring him and singing Hosanna as he came in to the city of Jerusalem. God can use any life that is given 100% to him. There was a dog that came into a, a military camp in Shanghai, China. This dog had a mouthful of pages. The chi Chinese soldiers chased him down, looked at the pages, and they were amazed at what they found. They were intrigued by what they found on these pages. And so they followed the dog. They followed this dog back to a, a missionary hospital. And as they asked about this literature and asked, is there any more like it, they met Dr. Jonathan Goforth. Jonathan Goforth, a great missionary. And Jonathan Goforth went back with them to that military camp and enrolled that day 200 men in Bible study. God can use a dog. God can use any of us. That's been one of the, the most encouraging things in my life is to realize that it's not me, but it's God. I could work my whole life trying to do things for God. But the least that God will do through my life is much more than, than anything I could ever try or attempt to do for God. I've just got to surrender and give it to God and just watch what He does with my life. He doesn't give me a list of things that says, you meet this, you meet this demand, you do that, or I'm going to punish you. He asked me to come to the cross, receive His grace, and just watch the abundant life, the new life, this new creation, this more than conqueror type life to just take over and to watch him do wonderful things through my life and in the life of my family. When a father or a mother decides that for their house they are going to serve the Lord, that influence is greatly used by God. God uses their witness, their example, and God uses the standards that they bring into that house to influence those kids and to bring a change that makes those kids different than the world around them, but more like Jesus Christ. We need to learn to serve God. We serve Him in four ways. We can serve Him physically, getting involved wherever the need is in the church, wherever the need is in people's lives that, that God brings us across that path. We serve Him financially. Malachi 3 says, Why have you robbed God? How have we robbed you? In tithes and offering. We serve God through meeting the needs that are there financially in the church and in ministry. We do it by prayer. Prayer, the thing Jesus did more than anything else He did that Paul writes about over and over, praying for those in authority, praying for those who have needs, praying for ourselves, interceding for others, and we serve Him faithfully. It's not a two-year hitch. It's a lifetime of servants. It never changes. It just gets deeper and richer as we go through life. Let me finish by sharing with you the difference that it can make if we truly get serious and we truly honor God through His Word and to allow Him to bring in the type of life, the type of experience that can happen when people get serious about God. There's a book called The Mutiny on the Bounty. You've probably seen the movie, but you haven't seen it all. Because that story, real account, continues. The mutineers, after they mutinied against Captain Bly, they went to an island. The island is, is spelled P-I-T-C-A-I-R-N, Pitcairn Island. Nine mutineers arrived on that island. Six native men came with them, nine native women and one native girl. They arrived on that island, and 
they were just in disarray. Someone made alcohol, and this crude alcohol killed eight of the nine mutineers. Only one of them survived it. And this one that survived it, his name was Alexander Smith. Alexander Smith chanced upon a Bible. He found this Bible. He read this Bible. This Bible intrigued him. God changed his life by it. And he determined as the last remaining member of that mutiny party that he was going to make a society based on, on Christianity. And for 20 years, nobody came to that island. They just existed there under the direction and under the influence of the Scriptures. When somebody came, when, when a group came 20 years later, this is what they found. They found a community that did not have police because there wasn't any crime. They found a community without a hospital where there was no problem with disease. They found no asylum because there was no mental health problem. And they found there was no illiteracy. Nowhere in the world was human life so and property so completely safe as a society that was cleansed by a genuine Christian faith. We hold in the church, in the people of God, a great potential. It's almost like holding the medicine which can solve the disease. But as long as we're complacent, apathetic, do nothing, feeling like it's all over, the battle's been won by the other side anyway, that God, if he wanted to do anything, let him do it, do it himself. As long as we hold attitudes like that, things are going to get worse. But as soon as we're willing to make the hard choice beginning in our own homes, then you will see a tremendous movement of the hand of God. God loves every lost person. God loves every sinner as much as he loves any person that would call upon the name of Christ. And God wants to reach them and he will use us to do that. If we cooperate, by surrendering our lives and giving 100% to Him and becoming vessels in His hands. I'm going to ask you if you would to bow your heads. Ask you to close your eyes. This will be our time of invitation this morning. Ask you if God is moving upon your heart. Any decision, anything that God is speaking to you about, let me encourage you during these moments ahead that you be willing to walk out an aisle, to come down, to pray a prayer, maybe to kneel at the altar here. And to not let this moment pass without receiving what God has for you. Father, we thank you this morning for, for your word. We thank you for the hope that comes through the challenge that Joshua gave so many years ago. And Father, I just pray that you would break each of our hearts, make us contract before you. Help us to recognize that only through Calvary that can we ever come to you. Can we ever enter into your presence. But Father, because of Calvary, there is a great power and hope that comes through Jesus Christ. I pray this morning that if there are any here that are lost, any here that do not have a confidence about their relationship with you, that this morning they would come forward and invite Jesus Christ into their heart to be Savior and Lord. I pray that if there are any here this morning that need to make the hard choice, recognizing the wrong of their past, but being willing to rededicate their life for the future, that they also would make that choice this morning. Some might want to come and to join this fellowship, begin serving you, faithfully following what you would have them to do. Others might want to come and declare that you've called them to a certain place in ministry. Lord Jesus, you know our hearts. You know the needs that we have and the decisions we need to make. And I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that we would bring glory and honor to you by obeying you this morning. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.